Great. Seen any good movies lately? Um, no. <laughs> What's that? I don't remember. Oh, I don't remember the director, but Joseph Losey films okay. on Fandor yeah. are fantastic. Oh, Fandor is yeah, a good yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But right? they're from San Francisco, so we'll move along. from. <laughs> oh, so that's not here. Um, are we supposed to reframe the question? Oh, yeah. I don't it, know. It has something to do with the cinematic and its relationship to Los Angeles, where it was partly born, it wasn't totally born here, but Hollywood was born here, and popular motion pictures were born here, and what our relationship as artists is to that tradition and that presence might be a good place to start. Have you thought in terms of a cinematic context for your work? Um, or what does that what, even what mean? Do you mean? Yeah, That's what do you what mean I'm by saying. that? Well, I, I, I use film in my work. Yeah. I make films. I use films in my performance. Yeah. And um, film was one of my major artistic influences growing up. Yeah. Film and television. So it informs actually everything that I do in yeah. terms of my artistic practice. Do you remember anything, like, uh, of older films or things, what are the ones that really stick out to you as being sort of relevant to your work now? One of, oh, relevant to my work? Well. No. One of the films that I remember seeing as a kid on TV, and it just was so amazing, was The Day the Earth Stood Still. Oh, okay. And it just, well, it was fantastic. You know, or those things like The Wizard of Oz, or the things you see as a kid that are shown over and over on TV. Yeah. Do you see that cropping up in your work, for example, The Day that the Earth Stood Still? Um, not now, but at one point I did make a puppet that I named after that phrase, Klatu Barata Nikto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I find, you know, my work is actually... Um, drawn very much from cinematic forms, yeah. like thinking about film noir or thinking about other kinds of experimental films. But I never had thought about it in terms of L.A. particularly. Right. But this question really made me think about that. Yeah. yeah. Sort of the history of cinema yeah. here. Yeah. I never. Yeah. Didn't but, but I mean, I feel like I should pass this on. Yeah. But but I will say early film was also a big influence. And we'll come back to that. Sure. Well, I don't know about the question as it pertains to my work. Uh, I think for me, the draw, uh, the draw of the industry was, is, was sort of the subconscious draw, uh, not growing up in a big city, New York or Los Angeles. I had a choice at some point I had to make. And I think coming to Los Angeles uh, and making that decision to come here was probably in large part, whether I knew it or not, uh, because of the industry, uh, the mythology of the industry, mm -hmm. the desire to sort of be uh, a part of that dynamic, again, that dynamic mythology. When did you come to town? I came in 1989. Mm -hmm. Did you do touristy Hollywood things? Did you go on the Universal Studios tour? No, no, no. I. Um, Actually, I'd been here, my, my grandparents, my, my maternal grandparents lived in Canoga Park. My grandfather owned a biker bar <laughs> when I was a kid, so every other Christmas we would come out here. Uh, and I would go to Disneyland, and then we'd end up at the biker bar. Uh, and I just remember listening to country music with a bunch of bikers and uh, eating hamburgers and falling asleep yeah. you know, in, the, in the booth. Uh, but... When I moved out here, I came out here for school, uh, uh, thinking that I wouldn't be here very long. That seems like such a such a an event, a biker bar. Do you know? Oh no, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Did that crop up in your work at all? The maybe. I mean, yeah. Uh, maybe that's for someone else to see. But uh, kind of uh, sexy too, right? Or was it? You know, just sort of that sort of prairie. Not or. Uh, yeah, sort of sorted and fantastic. Oh right? yeah, in the in the row of bikes in the parking yes, lot. Yes, the that's bikes. what I really remember. Yeah, in, in the in the the bands. Yeah, and bikes are really reflective. Mm -hmm. Don't you have a lot of reflection in your <laughs> work? Um, so uh, I got to Los Angeles largely because of the film industry. I'd been 
working, um, I'm from Montana originally, and I'd fallen in love with, um, with European film um, and, you know, other foreign films and, and American independent film. And so for a few years, I was working behind the scenes at the Seattle International Film Festival, um, which some of the people running that ultimately organized the Palm Springs Festival. And um, so I was also meeting a lot of filmmakers and came here partly because I had been writing, I'd been singing, I'd been acting, I'd been doing all these different things. And so I thought, okay, you know, I don't want to be 80 and not have tried acting. So I came down and I was studying with Peggy Fury and, and, and others, um, Jeffrey Tambor at one point. And, um, and then I did a lot of work, um, development work for Arm & Hammer Productions, um, a little bit of PR work and, and office work for Sundance and other people. Um, but, you know, it was the 80s, and so basically what was being made here wasn't what I was seeing, except I'd fallen in love with, with Bergman, especially Persona, and The Silence are probably the ones that I find most haunting. Um, Herzog, starting with Strachek, and, um, you know, I love Cave of Forgotten Dreams. David Lynch, um, is, well, er, pretty much everything of David Lynch, and is especially um, Blue Velvet and Mulholland Drive and vendors, especially Paris, Texas, and, um, and, and Wings of Desire, and, and also uh, Bertolucci. And so, you know, when I think of um, what is Cinematica, I realized that for me a lot of it has to do with things like even uh, camera moves, you know, especially the dissolve. And a lot of my work is very involved with the dreamlike and the surreal. And so, um, you know, so so there's kind of a, an automatic connection in there. Mm -hmm. I find I found my way back to poetry. I'd been published as a poet before that, and then lost the thread, sort of, and and then came back. Uh, so that's a little a little mm. bit of it. <coughs> yeah, I'm from Los Angeles, and from an early age, I got to go. I told you guys before, I got to go on the studio lots to see films and television being made. And so it was demystified really early for me. And so I respond, I mean now still, I respond to sort of the, the, the pop or the sort of the, cr the crass commercialism as an aesthetic almost, do you know? And to go and sort of play with that and sort of the pop aspect of, of, of things. And my first job, was when I was in ninth grade, I was an assistant to a guy who was running one of the, the stagecraft locals. So I was very, I was around that and around sort of Teamsters and the whole, like that kind of thing. So I was just around it a, a, a lot, you know, and then just kept going into song and dance. And that was, that's my sort of background um, in, as I went into high school, that became interesting to me. So Fosse was, everything to me, you know, it's like that's a great influence as far as song and dance, film, sexy, mm -hmm. funny, really beautifully stylized, you know, so early on I kind of got the sense of, of all of that, but I was around a lot, that's why I was asking, did you, when, when you came here, did you, you know, do things that were more Hollywood, but you actually, you were here a lot before that. No, I think I was, I was more attracted to the idea than, than the actual uh, place itself. Yeah. Uh, so I would go to the beach, you know. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with that. I, I, you know, I, we, I remember going to Disneyland when I was a little boy once, uh, and it rained the whole time. Oh, yeah. I, I had a great time, though. So. Yeah. Well, so. yeah. I've done. I, it, I used to go to Disneyland every year with school. You know, and then as an adult, on just a little bit of hallucinogens and things like that. You know, so did the whole gamut of, of Disney. And you talk about early formative films, then that's animation. You know, and that's super exciting to me. And now, after really having done theater forever, um, I'm interested in really getting into animation. So I'm I'm meeting the people who are really doing a lot of animation and just trying to acclimate myself to that world because it's, it's brand new to me. And, so, and the work that I've done is really um, whimsical surrealist music theater, just sort of 
these alternate worlds, but fun. And uh, it just seemed like that would be a good natural extension for me to, to participate in animation, which is the same sort of thing, except in a different you know, medium. I mean, listening to everybody, I think for me, one of my biggest attractions to film or what I got from film, like I didn't come here for the mythology or to work in the business. I came here to teach at CalArts, but I was already an artist and making films. So there's the school that Disney built. That's true. Yeah. But, but I think it's really the artifice of film that I fell in love with and that is a big part of my artistic practice is that everything is knowledgeably fake, but standing in or creating some kind of illusion that we all decide to believe in, but we know is fake. And that tension and that beauty of that artifice is in my work and really what I think I got from, from film. I'm having a, a, an early memory of being here that may or may not be relevant, but um, uh, I, I didn't have a car, you know, for uh, a while, and I was taking the bus to this acting class um, in the valley, and um, these guys afterwards, you know, we'd go to the Thai restaurants and eat and stuff, and, and these guys knew that I was <laughs> interested in Fassbinder films, so they said, we, we want to take you to this new Fassbinder film, and uh, it's called The Lanes, and I thought, this doesn't, I don't, I haven't heard of this. So it's a bowling alley. <laughs> and um, I'd never been to a bowling alley uh, be before. Really? I'd never bowled, oh, yeah. Um, but the big lesson that I got out of it was when I was trying to send the, the ball down to hit the pins was that if, you, if, you, if you're just trying to hit the pins, you're probably going to gutter the ball. It's not going to work. But if you aim for the marks, which are closer, yeah. then you have a chance. Yeah. So this was my great, you know, kind of Zen bowling lesson, care of acting class. Bowling is interesting because uh, I, a friend of mine, in when we were both 20, um, we used to just get high all the time, and uh, we both went bowling, and I got the highest score I've ever gotten. It was really high, and 230 or something, which is to me just ridiculous. The only other time that that happened was when I was really overextended um, directing an opera. And I just had to be in a zone. And to, to take a break one day, I just thought, I have to go by myself and do something else. So I went bowling. It was crazy, just like it, you get into that thing, you get into a zone, and you know those, they have turkeys, three, three strikes in a row is a turkey. It's what they call it. It's a turkey. I got three turkeys in one game, and that's ridiculous. But I just, I, it is about sort of channeling or something like that, or really kind of that thing. <laughs> bowling movies. I really like The Big Lebowski. That's a really great movie. I love the uh, Coen brothers. Do you know? They're, they're just terrific. They did that movie, right? Yeah, I really love it. I have to segue because um, uh, the, 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 no, really, the, the Big Lebowski is modeled uh, after a guy that I was going out with when I was first down is here. Is that right? Yeah. Like, literally? Yeah, literally. How? Jeff Dowd um, was um, helping the Coen brothers with the marketing of Blood Simple um, as a, a producer's rep. And so we met them in Sundance when I was there, you know, before coming down here. And yeah, so. But he didn't bowl that much in, in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I think that brings up a point about Los Angeles. Like you were talking about going on to the set when you were young. Living in Los Angeles, all those people and all those stories, they're, they all intersect with real life. Like you'll be walking around and you'll see a house and you recognize it from a film. Or Marshall High School in my neighborhood is in every high school TV show. <laughs> or, you know, so, so there's something about living inside of that that's very interesting, I think. Um, again, about the artifice constantly being broken. And that's what I want to ask you about is you, you said that you, 
you employ elements of artifice that that you that you're confident will elicit a response. Yeah, you hope. And and um, uh, uh, you hope will do that. And what makes that is that a is that a classic element? You know, is it something classic or, or archetypical? Or do you know what I mean? Um, well, I work. I mean, my films are either. You know, I work with puppetry and objects and found materials. So often it'll be objects that might elicit a certain thing from you because maybe you didn't have that object, but it's a little figure, like a train figure. Or So using things that might have a kind of sense of cultural memory, but they're not being used the way they were used. Yeah. Or in my performances, I, I use film as part of the performance, but the main characters are puppets yeah. but they're they're not real they're not alive and so they're constantly reminding you of that line between life and death that they're walking all the time uh -huh. um, like, like Rauschenberg's sculptures use right sort he of used iconic found, elements yeah, yeah it doesn't yeah it's it's related and not related to Rauschenberg but cer certainly related to the history of collage mm -hmm which also is a big part of film, collage and montage and use of materials in a lot of different ways, yeah. Hey, you're a montage artist, right? Or is that, you classify yourself that, that, that way or? No, I've no. never considered myself <laughs> a montage artist. I don't know, what uh, is that? What is a montage artist I, here? I, I don't even know exactly, yeah. but. Uh, no, my work is, is uh, it's such a corny thing to say because it's so cliche nowadays, but. It's sort of conceptually based, and in, in, depending on the project, sort of the media is determined by what what needs to happen, and the best way to affect the real or to realize a work. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I worked. I did a lot of performance work for several years. Uh, I have an identical twin brother, and um, we sort of engaged that subject uh, pretty vigorously for a while. That's that's not the case any longer. Uh, it's harder to collaborate with a family member, I think, than it is uh, uh, in a, in another environment. But uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, my work really sort of spans spans the the sort of field of media from performance to video to collage. Uh, uh, so. And I don't know how my work relates to the sort of the overriding subject that we're supposed to be talking about tonight, other than the desire to the, the sort of like Hollywood and, and, and LA in a larger sense, the sort of the place where people can come and, and invent and reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hollywood, I think, uh, extends beyond sort of this geographic yeah. place itself. And that's probably what drew me here to begin with. It's, it, it, is, it is land's end, you know, it is still the last frontier in, in so many ways. And I think Hollywood mythologized that to the point where growing up, I grew up in Texas, where do you go? You do go to New York or you go to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I like the what weather. What kind of video is in your work or do you, or just is that occasionally you'll, you'll work in, in video or? Yeah, the video it? work uh, tends to be, uh, I wouldn't say, Docu documentarian in style, but it's it's uh, um, it's more or less describing events. It's it's narrative only only by default. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to document events or actions. Fluxus, in some regard, <clears throat> uh, would be a close analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the videos are are of my brother and I, sort of in the middle of performing. Uh, acts or or, uh, or Beckett, you said. <laughs> Beckett, exactly. Beckett is one of my heroes. So, uh, and oftentimes the performances took the to sort of took the, the the form of an experiment. So we, uh, and and actually quite legitimately they were are are considered experiments. So uh, they would draw from that sort of world of sort of the scientific or the world of the sciences, just in terms of uh, the scientific method, sort of incorporating that 
in, in, uh, as a strategy for creating a structure. <clears throat> so. Were you ever self-conscious about starting to create video? I mean, as far as it might Abs doing? Absolutely. You know, yeah. I never, I, I, you know, when I was in school, you had told me, you know, in 10 years you were going to be, be doing performance work. I would have laughed at you. I was like, no way will I ever do performance work. But the ideas came, and that's, that's how they had to be realized. Yeah. So you did do what you, you got to do. Did you feel like you were in, in any way getting permission from any particular filmmakers you know no actually uh i think you mentioned beckett beckett was a strong influence uh it, it, the influences or the, or the encouragement were more literary absolutely although uh yeah paris texas i mean movies like that that sort of they define hollywood by what it's sort of a uh, almost by a mission, you know, there's like, w they understand Hollywood, but they're sort of operate filmically outside of the, the Hollywood formula. Uh, they're more interesting that way. Well, that kind of makes me think about the whole experimental film community that's always existed here, or you brought up Flux, it's like artists who use video as a big part of their work, and they... I don't know what their relationship would be to Hollywood, but I do know that a lot of experimental filmmakers had jobs in Hollywood. Like they might be editors or color correctors or camera people, and they would take the leftover film and go make found footage films out of it. Or, you know, they, they would have access to optical printers and all this kind of equipment. So there is a kind of crossover that happened there and still happens somewhat, but a little bit less with the digital. Yeah. Um, so an artist like Pat O'Neill, you know, he was really integrated in the, in the film community here and, and developed a lot of his skills through his access to that equipment, you know. So there, there has always been a community of people working outside of Hollywood, but I think always, not necessarily informed by Hollywood, but aware of it or earning money from it. In relationship like to it, sort of or, necessarily. Or, or even in, in contrast to it, or right. reaction to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, a couple of things have come up. One, one is just about that. When I kind of got back into writing, um, I was going to workshops at the Midnight Special Bookstore on the Promenade and Beyond Baroque. And a lot of the people that were going um, were also people who had been working in film or um, at one time an, an editor, uh, an actor, um, somebody who was, I think he was doing set design, you know, and it was a place where you could, you could go and you could have creative control over your own work and you didn't have to wait for anybody's money, you know, um, and, and I think um, it was both informed by and in reaction to. Um, uh, so I wanted to say that, but also the thing about both Beckett, who's also one of my, you know, kind of ongoing inspirations, um, especially in uh, some of my work that's not poetry, some of the more kind of performative work, and collage and montage. Um, uh, I think especially montage um, in my poems is something that I, it kind of, it's like a condition I aspire to, you know, that sort of fluidity of, of rolling and, and maybe going outside of the, you know, uh, uh, of the, of the, the diurn, the diurnal, you know, world and into the nocturnal. Um, and collage um, has been really freeing a, a few times and I teach it sometimes when I'm teaching poetry. Uh, there was one poem that I wrote by putting all of these fragments of poems that I thought were gonna become longer poems, you know, like torn off of bank slips and, and envelopes and things into a picture that I had on a kitchen table. And then one day I started fishing them out and I thought, oh, actually these are great together. And so this became um, a, a poem that was one of my favorite poems in, in my first full length. But it was just great to know yeah, this is absolutely as legitimate as that thing that happens when the poem seems to come out of you more whole cloth. Well, well I have a question for you. I just, how do you feel like um, your interest in film has uh, seeps into your writing? 
or film genre or anything sort of related to that or even film writing? Um, one kind of contrasting thing, I guess, is I, I can do narrative poetry, but I don't consider myself primarily a narrative um, poet, but I think that to the extent that I can do it, um, a lot of it comes from the discipline of, um, you know, being a reader or, you know, kind of working in the industry and really, really looking at story in that way. Um, but, but it's more, I, I feel more connected, I think, to, you know, those kinds of films that I was talking about, like, like Lynch, that world of Lynch, or, you know, certain moments of, of Vendors or moments of Bergman, where there is sort of a blur, you know, like if you think about those great moments in Persona um, at night where you're not really sure if, if it's a dream or if it's, if it's meant to be real. Yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff like that in that film. And, um, and I'm really interested in, in anything that's liminal you know, anything that has that kind of sense of blur and boundarylessness and th threshold. Um, so, um, so those are some of the, the filmmakers that I kind of go back to. I think that idea of the liminal space is, yeah. it's very important to me in, in my work too. And yeah. I don't know how much of that comes from film, I don't know. Yeah. But, but it does exist in that liminal space between sort of something real and something not real. And, uh, but I was also thinking when you were talking at the beginning about dissolves and I think yeah. film form yes. has affected every bit of art in the yeah. 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just the idea of cutting or, right. you know, m jump cutting or dissolves or that something is here and then it's over here. Right. Something you could do in film, now we do in live performance. I mean, it's been going on right. for a while. Right. It's not new, but right. I, I think film form has really permeated a lot of art making. Yeah, or even like an extreme close-up, um, you know, when I'm in, in poems, I'm not just thinking of mine, but um, some other poets uh, might focus for a second on something that seems peripheral, you know, like in a glimpse that's not, um, you know, that wouldn't be the, the, the main, the central um, subject of a scene, but it has so much information that's so potent. I did a performance once. I, I did it first in New York, but then I, I did do it here, um, where it was influenced by film noir, and it was a character that was going through eight different miniature sets that the audience went from set to set. And actually, there were eight of the character because she existed in every one of these settings. And for most of the sets, they were sort of like dioramas, and the audience of eight people would stand in front of them and watch a three or four minute scene. But then I had one scene where I had slits around both sides of the stage, and the audience would put their eyes right up to the, the borderline, that liminal space. and Afterwards, I realized, because people would talk about it, like, that was so shocking to be that close up. It was like a close up in a film. And I didn't really realize I was doing that, but there's something about in live performance being able to be that close that has that same power, you know, or when someone comes really close to you in a performance as an audience member. What about you? What about you? <laughs> No, I mean in terms of your performance and and film. There's and a lot of there's a lot of video and live feed that goes into a lot of theater now. You know, it's oh, such yeah. an important part of it. You know, to to get that close up effect that you're talking about, and then just as another as a sort of a three ring circus element, you know, to the performance is is very interesting. Going back to what you'd said about collage, you know. Um, Again, I sort of started in musical reviews, which is a collage, and then I worked with this guy named Reza Abdo, who was all about collage. So I learned about collage, and then as I was trying to start making films, I made a, a really bad vampire movie, and uh, and and I I tried to employ some of those techniques, and it didn't for me. It didn't work out as well. I think I, I so when you talk about. Um, you know, the dream states and things like that, I think it's, I feel like, and my response to that is I feel like it's still a linear trajectory to a storytelling, which I think, 
and that you know Maya Deren is not that you know right. and so but it's but if but for me I couldn't employ the collage my collage education and experiences to film and because people were just sort of saying no people weren't saying but I was trying to make a story but I only but I really wanted to employ like that weird song and then that weird song and 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 kind of sew it all together and it had to have a different it was a different discipline that that uh, that I needed to have and I needed to grow and subsequently I hope have more you know but it, I, I did find I, the concept of collage is very important to me you know and I would love to sort of if I can find my way back to that I don't know if you guys know about a, a, a cartoon called Adventure Time it's so brilliant and it's so weird. Yeah, it's so because it's non sequitur. Yeah. yeah. So, so as much as film has, you know, influenced artists, I think artists have influenced film. Yeah. And and all the different art forms have found their way back into film. Like, you know, I mean, collage again from the beginning. Film. There have been filmmakers using collage, but mm -hmm. there's something about that sense of time in that cartoon that really they're still telling the story yeah. though it really it's it's linear but it's whacked you know it's and so many disparate elements that are so interesting and and uh just really jarring sometimes in such a great way so the story is linear and the imagery is non sequitur or um non sequitur is a great word <clears throat> you know it's about it's about a a boy and his dog and the mm -hmm. the dog i think farts a lot or something i don't know it's just like in it and <laughs> it's uh, and it's and they have um you know adventures mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and they meet the king of this and the blah, 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 you know and so they have you know, they go on a, a, a quests and things like that. So in that way, it's linear. But then they'll come across the talking, eating flower or, you know, some whatever cat singing in Spanish or, you know, it, or, or sometimes in that show, they'll switch all the characters. So the dog is voiced by the boy character. And, you know, it's just it's non sequitur. And I want, you know. And kids and stoners really love it, you know, and really respond to it. And which is great because it, it sort of in that way, it is just sort of wide open. Was Olan Jones part of the Bar Beyond Baroque, do you know? Um, she might have been before I was there. I'm not sure. I think she was more involved with Padua. Yeah, I see. Right. Yeah. I just remember. Some, yeah. Yeah. She was she's getting back to guitar playing. Olan Jones is. Do you know her? OK. Yeah. So just a great actress and, a, and an artist and a composer as well, um, you know, who, who's very invested in art and, you know, and definitely a, you know, pretty successful actress, you know, mm. so in that way making that. Well, well, we sort of keep coming back to this thing of like artists in Los Angeles who aren't necessarily working in the film industry and, and LA as a town that you decided to stay in as an artist, even though you came here for something else. So, so what do you think it is about LA that has kept you here? Uh, well, I used to say people move here for all, any number of reasons, but they stay because of the weather. Uh, and that's partly true. Uh, I mean, as a, as a, a, a sorry, newly minted grad student in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a more affordable place to live, uh, the alternative being New York. <clears throat> it allowed me, uh, now I see it as a luxury, the luxury of, of a part-time job and a space and the, the remaining available time to make art. Uh, Hollywood was the, it was the lure. It was, the, it was sort of the bait and switch, it really was. Uh, it got me here. <clears throat> but I think, uh, I, again, I mean, I'll go back to the, I think the idea of Hollywood is the strong, it's the magnet that brings all these creative people here. And, um, <clears throat> and they stay, who knows, for uh, any number of reasons. You know, everyone's got their own reasons, but uh, it's, the rare, it's the rare individual who's actually from this area. Uh, so uh, most people I know are from somewhere else and they come here to, see, to seek out creativity. So, I, and I attribute that a lot to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when I was coming here from New York, all of my friends in the Lower East Side um, kept saying, well, you have to meet David Wilson, you know, who runs the Museum of Jurassic Technology. So I made it a point to go and, and meet him, like, within the first month that I came here. And I went to an event there that was a lecture on bird calls um, by a very eccentric man who was showing slides, actual slides of, of birds and making sounds. Um, and then I sat next to David and spoke to him. And after it was over, I said to my husband, okay, now I can live in Los Angeles. <laughs> because I, I, th I think I was sort of afraid that it was all Hollywood and all the industry and all people working in the business. Even though I'd been here a couple of times to things at MoCA, and I didn't really know the city. And so from that introduction to David, who started the museum from as a model maker working in movies, and, and then making his own models, you know, in his spare time that started to gain this other kind of fictional, historical, you know, presence. Um, so he had that skill, and he went to CalArts too, of course. Um, but the fact that he could exist and thrive and make this place here seem, okay, there's something really interesting here. And in the years since, I've uncovered a few other things like that. You know, there's the panorama or different little enclaves in different neighborhoods where you find a certain little tiny art space or a studio. And, and so Los Angeles then becomes your own map of these places and people. And it's very different from a city like New York. And I love New York. So I had to find a way to understand this city that was different from what I knew. But you grew up here. I mean, why did you stay? Um, I moved around a lot. Uh, but I would always come back here because it was, it was home. But, you know, I started in not an artistic world at all. I started in commercial entertainment and was having a great time. And uh, all the way into my early 30s, that's what I was doing. I was making these sort of industrial shows for hotels or a dinner theater in Catalina Island and doing all these yippy skippy songs and loving it, having a great time. And if I'd kept doing that, I'd be a millionaire, you know, but, uh, and, but I met Reza and, um, and through him, a very important mentor, obviously. I worked with him for seven years and was his choreographer. So I understood what he was doing on a some visceral level. I had no idea intellectually what he was up to. It was like, do you want me to do what? Okay. And um, but through that became very sensitive to the arts community and 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 wherever I lived with him for a, a while and, and um, just kept sort of following him to Bob Flanagan shows or you know things like that that was like wow you know yeah no not at all and and Reza's work was intense you know and and it was crazy for me as a like a song and dance guy in a little blue sweater so you know now get all naked and you know crazy stuff so it's like that was really a mind F and uh, you know to to have that transition and I used to see his work I would do one show and then feel like I was some sort of spiritualist flogging myself, you know, to, to really exorcise the upper middle class guy that I was, you know, with all my sort of conventional precepts. And then, you know, was able to um, finally kind of understand that and embrace it and love it and become, and then do my version of song and dance, which is then was considered art you know <laughs> and then that's an interesting concept like what is right. art you know in uh, like I think I, I say that if, as long as, as long as people are singing in four-part harmony and dancing in unison people love it you could get away with anything and I got away with a lot of, of sort of wild collage just by having those conventions what you're talking about in a way these sort of iconic images or, or things that are familiar enough to draw people in or to captivate them on some level but then sort of take them on another ride right 
Um, ultimately, f for me, um, when I found my way back to, to poetry, it was uh, it was a little bit uh, later than when when Bob Flanagan was at Beyond Brook. He was he was dead by the time I got there, um, though his influence was still there. Um, but then, uh, out of of those workshops and others, a bunch of um, poets. Um, that uh, I still workshop with, a bunch of us found our way to um, doing a master class with David St. John, who I had known at Oberlin many years before that, and then you know suddenly we were both out here. Um, and he's been very instrumental in, in a, a lot of poets' lives in LA. And, and then Ralph Angel and Cecilia Wallach, and uh, there are a whole bunch of, of really interesting poets here. Um, and the poetry community, there actually is one, and it's, it's hard to find a community, a sense of community in LA that stays. I mean, in the film business, you know, there are all of these sort of uh, temporary communities that are really intense. And then after something's over, you can feel kind of cut off. But the poetry community is pretty porous and it has a way of um, continuing and people will actually drive across town to see each other read, although that's harder now with, with, with traffic. So I realized that I was actually thriving as a poet here, and it was partly because of going to workshops once a week for a really long time, sometimes more, you know, and having that sort of soft deadline and, and inspiration and sparring. Um, and then things kind of kept growing out of that, and then teaching, you know, out of that. So it, it and I, the light, not for me the weather so much. I actually really miss snow, um, but the light, you know, there's something about the quality of the light. Well, one thing I was thinking about is that, you know, going back to film form and things you were talking about, about collage, is that the film is so ubiquitous now. And, you know, we're all carrying around cameras. We're all, you know, I heard actually Sherry Lansing. Did we you hear that NPR the, thing? You used yeah. the term film. I use, I use the term film broadly, and I, I, or cinema. That's now what you actually, that is the term, cinema. Is it? Yeah. Because it's... Like younger filmmakers who are working in experimental film are s working in cinema. So I've, I have to learn to work in cinema now. But um, there's something <laughs> about everyone having that access uh -huh. that has both democratized it and made it sometimes too ubiquitous, but it's, it's changed it a lot, I think, and, and changed it out of Hollywood's hands in a lot of ways. Right, right. It seems like uh, the, the medium is being redefined by, by the technology. I see, uh, I see my daughter watching whatever she watches on a little bitty iPhone, and it's not, it's not the traditional narrative. It's, uh, it's uh, hands and a voice. And it's someone playing with Legos, baking a cake, you know, and it's just this voice. And this voice is uh, sometimes Australian, sometimes uh, English, but with a Korean accent, you know, and, 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 and you start to see the characters sort of being arrived at through the, the painted fingernails or uh, the inflections in the voice and where they emphasize the, uh, the important sort of structures within the set. The set is oftentimes, I mean, for my daughter, Legos or, or uh, how to bake a cake. I mean, it's such an odd uh, uh, thing to be fascinated by. When I grew up watching TV, we had three channels. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the narrative structure was dis uh, already determined, and, and, and it was uh, there was a rich and long history in, in how that that structure was was arrived at. I think primarily through Hollywood, uh, and I see a lot of that's what when I hear filmmakers and, and uh, writers talk about film and writing, it's it's uh, almost in contrast to what we understand as the Hollywood model, and I think. That's where I see a lot of the creativity coming from, is people come here, again, for any number of reasons, but to look for that creative, that creative force that, and I, again, uh, it's, it's maybe Hollywood is, in my view, getting too much credit, but it's this place now 
that it's, it's generated a critical mass. You don't have to go to New York anymore. And when I graduated, that was the big question. Do you go back to New York? Do you go to New York? Do you stay here? Well, if you stay here, you have a cheap place to live, but mm, that might be all you get. You know, so. well, well, teaching at CalArts, um, since I started teaching there, I've noticed a huge shift in the percentage of especially graduate students who stay in Los Angeles mm -hmm. instead of going to New York. Yeah, and it's not just you can have a cheap place to live, because it's not that cheap, actually. But you can have a garage, or you can have a shed in your backyard, or you can have a driveway. You can have, actually, a place to work. And so space is really essential. And there's, I think, a, a big community now of, of visual artists, performance artists, you know, filmmakers that are staying here and sort of forming what you're dis d d um, describing in terms of the poet's community. And, and there's circles of overlapping communities, um, but, but I think that's a really good thing. And it's always been here, but I think it's reaching a kind of critical mass. And it's, it's more, of, uh, it's easier and important actually to sort of um, commodify, like those hands got a million you know, hits on, you know, YouTube, you know, and I, I was, My I was, you know, exactly. And so, yeah, a million times. And I went to a, was at a meeting today with a, um, I've been commissioned to write a musical. So I'm writing the book to a musical and this, and this uh, producer is also has an animation company. And so we could write this musical and it could be an animated film, which would be great for, because I'm interested in that sort of thing. But so much of the conversation was about the amount of you know, traffic that this project could get on all of the different you know, uh, ways to, you know, to, to, share that, to share that product. You know? I thought that was... And so that's becoming such a, a thing. And yes, it's opening it up creatively a lot, but it's also, you know, it's really, but it's also getting artists to think, you know, about product and yeah, about right. the, the monetary ramifications of what they're doing. Right, but there's also this other thing that's happening that's from those likes and everything. Like it used to be, okay, you come to Hollywood or you come to New York. You can just be a kid in your dining room. I mean, my son is a teenager. He has, he's an 18 year old. He knows people who make money from their Instagram by putting up cool photos and modeling and doing these different things. So that's what they're aspiring to right now. They don't really understand how ephemeral that is. But so, so there's this other Hollywood that's sort of beckoning people to the same kind of instant fame. Um, that's, it's interesting to watch. I'm glad I'm not doing that. <laughs> this is a little bit, a, a little bit away from the, um, the like kind of conversation, but I was just thinking as you were talking about how uh, one of the, the things that's been going on for a while in poetry, but it's kind of gaining more traction now, is cinepoetry. Um, and sometimes, it's, um, it's film or footage or photos or montages made of stills um, dissolving into each other or whatever, um, along with words. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes, you know, because lyric poetry is poetry that there might be a story in the background, but it's not really about defining the context of the story so much and all of the details as delivering you right to that sort of naked emotional center. Of, of a moment and um, with the sort of sensory specifics around that, mainly through imagery, you know, and I, I mean, I think imagery is, is one of the really strong connections I feel to film as, as a poet because largely in, in poetry especially, um, you're, you're not talking in abstract words, you're talking in images, you're trying to leave traces you know, phenomenological traces on the minds of whoever you're, you're, you're speaking with. Um, but the cine poetry is interesting because some of the cine poems are not narrative, but more like the sort of lyric moments of really early filmmakers before narrative became uh, stronger, 
uh, need and tendency, especially when we got into, you know, the monetization of it. And, um, and sometimes it's just about image or, or you know, image and, and music or flow and creating that feeling of transport with means that are um, more image than word. Well, well, it really kind of goes back to the history, early history of film then because there were all these tracks of filmmaking and one was what the scholar Tom Gunning called the cinema of attractions. And that was film that did not have a narrative necessarily. It was all about creating interesting imagery, creating experiences like dreamlike experiences or trick films or, or a kind of documentary film about just like, here's some people leaving a factory. You know, here's what it's like behind the lunch counter. You know, and, and all of those things were very exciting to people. What's a trick film? A trick film, well, the, the most famous trick filmmaker that you can find online is uh, George Melies. So he, you know, people began to realize what you can do with the camera. And so he would set up a scene and it, it kind of looked like the way 19th century theater looks, usually like a curtain and, and you know, like vaudeville. And there might be a woman standing there and then he'd stop the camera and get her out of the frame and then you come back and she's not there. So it w he w used cinematic tricks. So that was like a beautiful form. And now we call that special effects, you know, and it's really sophisticated, but it was much more this revealing of the artifice, I think, in those early... And have fun with it, yeah, you know. Yeah. Where do you get inspiration? Where do you get inspiration for your text in your work? Um, well, I would say less the text than the. Well, in my films, I'm mostly not using text, but in my performances, that I usually work from some kind of story. And as I've lived in LA longer, those stories are much more coming out of LA. So one of the pieces I did a few years ago was about a girl who was kidnapped and murdered in East LA. Mm. And, and it was more about the, her disappearance and how that affected people around her. But the story wasn't told through like a very literal kind of news story, who done it kind of thing. It was more uh, emotional. Um, and so I, I use puppetry and film. So the film, the main, one of the main images was of her sister just digging in the dirt and looking for clues. And so then we would do live feed of the puppet's hands and project that. And so working with the materiality, the set was just like a big landscape with very little green on it um, because she was kidnapped in East LA and then she was found in San Bernardino. So just thinking of that travel into the wild sort of, not the city of San Bernardino, but the mountains. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm really actually, I don't know, permeated by the stories that happen here. And I'm a, an obsessive newspaper reader still, uh, and um, and then you know research into other kinds of things. I did a, a piece <laughs> that was weirdly about um, the the tuberculosis hospitals that started springing up here in the 30s. The City of Hope Hospital started as a bunch of tents on the mountains east of Los Angeles, and and so just those little bits of history actually is where most of the work comes from yeah. wow. and then just getting into research about it and telling these sort of emotional poems almost you know so stories and stories is a thing mm -hmm. yeah in, in, in my performances stories yeah. are a thing in in my films it's a little bit looser and yeah. more of a progression of events mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they're, it's, it's very, they're very different, and so I kind of like working between those forms yeah. and then using them together when I can, too. Do you work in stories? I, well, I, uh, not, not a lot, yeah. you know. I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll come up. Yeah. But what I was thinking about story was um, relating to film, um, 
Uh, I'd mentioned uh, David St. John, and there's a particular poem of his called Meridian, which is a, um, a story about an encounter with uh, a woman who seems to be maybe, uh, there's some kind of relationship there, you don't know what it is, and it turns out that she has um, a, a really devastating problem with, with drugs, and and the, but what, what the reason that I'm bringing it up is that um, when Michael Ballhaus died a few weeks ago, the cinematographer um, who did a lot of stuff for Fassbinder but also for Scorsese and, and, and others, there's this amazing um, kind of infamous um, dolly tracking shot at the beginning of Goodfellas that took I think it took about a day to set up. That's, did you know this shot? It's like one long, uninterrupted, yeah, uninterrupted shot where they come through the bowels of the restaurant and then come out into the main side. And you learn all of this detail of character as that's going on. That's what this poem reminds me of in the way it's constructed. It's like this kind of really intricate um, shot that's set up that way so that you can barely breathe by the time you get through it and then you realize you, you, are, are, you have so much information by the end. And there's another, another more recent poem like that. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that I was thinking of where you know, talking about the sort of technical side of film and, and camera moves, um, relating it to story, not, not mine particularly. Mm -hmm. But to story. storytelling, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I think about the, the question of story, and uh, I think as an artist, my job is to tell a good story. And uh, so I'm thinking about where in my work can I identify this idea of story. And uh, I think when I was doing these performance pieces with my twin brother, they, the form was really a, 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 sci a, a science experiment. It, it was a simple simple setup uh, there was one where we tried to solve a crossword puzzle telepathically one of us had the clues the other had the puzzle uh, and it went on for over an hour so the audience uh, the story came from the audience the audience brought their own stories to what it whatever their uh, conception or, or, or their ideas of what twins are supposed to, to be like or the special sort of connective powers that twins must have they're uh, you know they they're they're identical they must they must be closer they must have some special bond uh, and so the story really was just uh, brought out through the context uh, there wasn't a lot going on so the story was really uh, uh, fabricated in the minds of, of all, the, all the audience members. And the story was, in that regard, variable. Mm -hmm. So everyone sort of made it up. I love that you really understood how intriguing twins are to people and sort of worked with that, <laughs> you know? Well, we resisted it forever, for, for, for decades. And it, it just, it finally just reached a point where uh, we just had to run with it. <laughs> you know, you go, you go where the work takes you. Sure. And you just have to follow the work sometimes. And uh, that's how, again, that's how the, uh, me becoming a performance artist okay. happened. It would not have happened any other way. You mean by yourself? or No, yeah. I, I prefer to be behind the camera, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> or in my studio making work. So uh, really, it was a situation where uh, the motivation was so strong uh, that there was no way to deny uh, pursuing it. Yeah, I find, I find twins really fascinating. I, I think, did, was it that you did back it or that I was trying to talk we you did into do, doing we did, back it? No, we, we did uh, one of the other, another performance was uh, uh, the setups were generally the same. They, they took the form, sort of a, formally, of a, like a three-act play. So the first act was literally like a song and a dance. And the second act was the experiment. And the third act was sort of a, a return to the song and dance. The third act tended to be a little somber, or sort of, sort of yeah, sort of a, you know, a segue out. Um, but 
the first act in one of these performances slash experiments was uh, the reenactment of uh, Act One of Waiting for Godot. Uh, so it's two, two characters. Uh, we were twins, and in the middle of it all, we switched characters, and that really was just, just a, such a simple effect. We just changed hats and then switched positions and just kept right on going. So, so. Did you ever do uh, Ohio Impromptu together? No. Where there are, it looks like there are two characters who look exactly alike. It's like, per, it's, per, it's built for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, it's, you, you have to do that. <laughs> Your brother has to has to agree. She, she hates it if she pushes you. Uh, you know, I uh, yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, how many how many more collaborations I have in. Well, me, well so. I already told him I, I have a space he can do it in. Yeah, <laughs> so I I keep fishing fishing for ideas and uh, not ideas, but on on sort of st strategies to convince my brother mm -hmm. to participate. Money. <laughs> that was. That That's a strong happen. motivation, but it would be a lie in this case. <laughs> so, well, well, I'm curi curious, Ken. Like, you're t taking what you've been doing as a live performance into film, and what kind of translation that involves. And also, I mean, film has a lot of people involved. I mean, I don't know if you've hit that phase of it yet, where there's an assistant for every assistant and you're with a, working with a lot of people and it's very different probably from how you've worked before. I mean, I know you work with groups, but a different kind of chain of command. Yes, I, I think what's, what's benefited all of us, me in this case, is um, just intuitive response. And so then, to have a very distinct um, aesthetic and to make decisions based out of intuition. And so, and then to sort of build leadership skills with, and working with large casts and lots of designers in theater, um, you know, as a director or as a writer, both a lot of the time. Um, so, so it primed the pump for that. And then so, the largest film project that I worked on, I mean, I've acted in large film projects, but um, was a, I did a cowboy film, as sort of, uh, <laughs> it was, and I'm really proud of it. It's, you know, it, but it was, it, it had um, 13 locations all over California. I worked with um, UC Irvine's musical theater department. I worked with a church in Tulare, their choir and their bell choir, lots of horses, lots of people riding those horses, cows and all the rest of that. Um, and all that needed to be pulled together and organized and whatever. And I did it for $30,000, which means that you, I know. So you really have to do a lot of communing you know, and that sense of community, we were talking about sort of the poet community and then like this film, I was thinking about this as you, you know, is that these people had an experience, they're not gonna soon forget, you know, to go into, a, 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 there's a North, Northern California clogging association, they're clog dancers, you know, and for us to collaborate for six months because they were up there and I was down here, I give them a piece of music and they're like, we, this is great and we want to buy shirts for this, great, buy shirts for this, you know, and, and all the rest of that. So it, it just becomes, you know, we all get it done you know, because we have to. And so it just, as, as I was doing these music theater shows here, they got bigger and I, I just sort of understood how to multitask and do all the rest of that. Then it just turned into uh, how to do that for film. Yeah, it worked, it worked out that way. I tend to love it. It's very difficult, you know. It really just takes years off your life. <laughs> you know, you worked in that, but it's, but it's, just there's nothing more rewarding if you feel like you've come up with something good and you can get it out there. If it's not distributed, we're sort of talking about YouTube and all the rest of that, you know, right. if it's not out there, then it's depressing, you know, because you've done all that work for, for nothing. And so then it's about 
you know, the chore of doing that. We, we opened the first weekend at Outfest um, in the DGA Hall, which was cool. Yeah, it was, it was so gratifying, yeah. you know, to have that experience. And then it wasn't ready, so we kept cutting it down progressively, you know, uh, different screenings. We would just make it tighter and better and, and uh, didn't stop when it was at the DGA. We wouldn't go, oh, there, it's done. It's so great. It was just like we needed to make sure that it was, it was fulfilling in that way. But I liked I get overexposed. I, I know I seem gregarious, but I'm actually one of those extroverted introverts, yeah. you know. Right. And um, so it's, it's a little wearing to be really in front of so many people sort of consistently, but, it, but there's nothing more satisfying, you know, especially if you know you're building community, which is something I do. Well, I, I come from a visual art background, solitary, you know, then I started doing performance, so there's people involved, but I have no desire to make a big movie. Uh, it's to me, it, it, I mean, and I know if you have that desire and you're good at that, it's the best thing, but I really like working in a, in a much smaller way where I feel like I can be in control, not in a control freak kind of thing, but just where... I, I can make decisions and they happen, you know. Um, yeah. How has teaching sort of changed that? Because you have to be in, with people, in front of people. Oh, yeah. It's not like I'm, I'm a, yeah. I, I think I'm a, <laughs> a recluse. Uh, extroverted, <laughs> introverted extrovert. Oh, yeah, what yeah, a, one of those combinations. I'm not an extrovert, but I, but I have a social, I'm socially fine, you know. So I actually learn a lot from teaching, you know. I, I find it really exciting what people come up with, you know, and I, I don't teach like as a dogmatic lecturer kind of teacher. I teach by creating situations for other people to make work to, to thrill me. You know? <laughs> yeah. Inspire me. Uh, I had uh, drinks with Charlie Adler and Charlie Adler is the voice of everything and did a lot of voice direction in cartoons and he's a little older than I am and just like this go have drinks with him. He's like, you know, and just like, oh, wow, you know, he's a lot. But he was really stressing just how everybody is coming out of CalArts, um, all these animation people. It's, and it's, it's like a direct line to making lots of money in animation if you go to CalArts. I mean, there, there are several, I have teach actually in the theater school, but I deal with a lot of film students and there are a couple of programs, so there's character animation, which is the pipeline if you want to work in the industry. And then there's experimental animation, where the some people want to work in the industry, but they're mostly you know individual artists who are interested in that form as their form of art making, you know. And uh, but there's also this big interest now in immersive entertainment. Um, like people come out and they work for companies like Thinkwell and and Disney and Imagineering and they're finding like designers and theater directors or, and playwrights they're finding their way into that world of storytelling. It's a different form, but it seems really attractive to people right now in a in a different way than sort of the Hollywood movie model. You're talking about live immersive theater? Yeah. yeah. Well, not just the live immersive theater, like the big, you know, theme parks and oh, yeah. narrative, the narrativity of that kind of entertainment. Mm -hmm. They're looking for people who have those skills and innovations and can work in that mm -hmm. really big system. So it's just interesting to observe. There's still plenty of people just coming out and wanting to make their own right, right. work, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And maybe trying to figure out always how to make a living while you're doing that, right. you know. That's what changed for me is like, you know, I'm going to start making a really great living, you know. And that's, that's right. now at 55, I've decided I'm going to make a living. This is a great idea, you know. And so to really it's focus on that, to see about that, you know. And to, that's part of the game for me, you know. Because I've lived how I've lived. I can live like this forever, you know. But it's also, wouldn't that be interesting, a different adventure, you know. And so then it's like, all right, who's going to have me? Do you know, who, where do I get to play? And I just think it's an interesting thing to try for. Yeah. You know? 
in the film industry, cinema. Um, I want to veer a little bit actually back to what you were talking about with allowing the audience to make the story um, because it's, it's something that every once in a while I'll experience um, after a reading um, where, uh, especially with, you know, with the, the part of the idea about a lyric poem um, is that there, there are going to be gaps. Not everything is going to be told. And I've had experiences sometimes, sometimes with really short poems, where somebody in the audience thought it was about something completely different. Mm -hmm. But it was really moving to them. It really mattered to them. And so I learned um, not to correct that perception and to you know, allow, uh, allow for that ambiguity to happen. I think actually, in, pr in particular with poetry, um, ambiguity is one of the powers of poetry and that it allows for somebody in an, an audience to have an experience that you can set up but you can't completely control. Mm -hmm. And then the thing is to let go of that and let them have it. I, I completely agree. I, I think that's, that motivates a lot of things that I do. That it's, so it's not like I'm trying to make work that's opaque or, you know, distant or any of those things, but that allowing for the ambiguity for people to have their own experience, as you're doing, you know, um, while giving them whatever it is you want to give, you know, not holding back in any way. When I, when I was first um, living in New York, I made a living as an illustrator, but like um, the New York Times book review, th literary kind of illustration, yeah. And I learned from that experience, I had like two days to make a drawing. I would read the review and I had two days. And what worked best was not to make something that really pointed to the writing, but that kind of suggested something and, and, and was ambiguous. Right, and maybe a little oblique. Yeah, yeah. So that I, it was a very good kind of learning ground for me to, for that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, speaking for myself as an artist, <clears throat> I don't know, I don't believe I'm in any better position to understand like the effects of the outcome of my work than any viewer uh, and what they might bring to it. So, and as f as far as uh, ambiguity, I think uh, I've always strived, at least in in my ideas, is for clarity, and it is p through the clarity that allows for the ambiguity. Yeah. I've, I, and I've noticed things that I do that are somewhat ambiguous just create confusion. Mm -hmm. I don't like, them. you know. So, uh, yeah, it's not like the intention is ambiguity, but right. through knowing what you're doing, right. but trusting it right. and not having to explain it, right. that allows a certain kind of ambiguity that lets other people in. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking of things where there are very clear images, um, but it's, it's possible for something to be interpreted more than one way. And sometimes the way someone takes that in um, merges with a really potent emotional memory. It's, mm. it's interesting. Yeah. How about you and ambiguity? Well, it's interesting to come from, like, like I said, cheesy song and dance, and then to create surrealist work with those elements. And I did, and that's, you know, and people are like, well, I don't know what it is, but it's delightful, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and it's that sense of delight that I think it would be great to bring to animated films or just cinema in general. <laughs> well, I mean, I think one of the sort of big things coming out of this discussion is not so much that any of us are working in reaction to the mm -hmm. film industry or against it or, or not necessarily in confluence with it, but that being here, it is a big part of our landscape and we engage in it in a lot of different ways and we're affected by it. But it's, it's kind of also made the space for all this eccentric art and profound art to develop. I mean, we haven't even talked about music in Los Angeles, which is a very powerful uh, current. The experimental music in LA is 
I think one of the most vibrant mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it just seems like L.A. has always been, but if you think about all those composers that came from Germany and really affected also the film industry. Um, so it's it's really a place where a lot can happen and does happen and it seems to be good for that right now. I still dream of New York sometimes. <laughs> But less so. Right. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> and with that. <coughs> I'll say it's really nice to actually get to talk to you guys. <laughs> and, and that these conversations, if, there, if nothing else happens, I think it's bringing people together that wouldn't have come together. And in LA, that's a difficult yeah. thing. <laughs> That's all I got. I, I'm just going to, this is funny. I was, it took me an hour and a half to drive across from Venice, of course, right? Oh. So I always listen to KCRW. And, uh, and I, happened to, um, I happened to hear Eric Garcetti, actually, on the way over. So we may as well end there, uh, talking about LA as an imperfect paradise. Mm. And I thought that was good, mm. you know. So maybe part of what we're doing is we're embracing that imperfection. <laughs>